Uh, let's welcome Dr. Cheryl Lee, Medical Director and Ophthalmic Surgeon of Pacific Eye Centre to give us a presentation on the importance of healthy diet for the good eyesight. My name is Cheryl. I was very pleased, I was looking through the crowd, I recognised Daniel Martin, the famous Daniel Martin, uh, and he interviewed me four years ago on the implantable contact lens, um, and I'm a cataract and retinal surgeon. So my bit of the talk is the effects of carbohydrates and sugars on the eyes. So this is all the sort of young stuff that we take for, you know, what we have at the whole center. The type of patients I see, the thing now is that many of us think that we should be seeing or talking about fat people. The majority of patients I see are not fat. They're actually quite slim. We're talking about people like this. Yeah, these are my implantable contact lens patients. They are all our competitive athletes. That's one group. The second group are the people at this age group where they have Lao Hua or presbyopia, where your arms are not just, just not long enough anymore, can't read anymore. And then the third group, which is what we're talking about a lot today, is this, where they're slightly bigger in size and they have health risks such as diabetes and high blood pressure. But what I realized about all my, all my patients is that they all need to be on a low carb so this is not to say you've got to look like this before actually needing to be on a low carbohydrate and sugars diet. I'm saying this because I started on this about four years ago. And uh, the reason why I did is I went to my best friend, she's one of the top anti-aging doctors in Singapore, and I said, I don't need to lose weight. I've never been fat. But the reason that I want to do this is I want to be healthier. And I don't actually know how. I don't know what I should eat or should not eat. And she said to me, she said, well, if you hadn't asked, I wouldn't have brought this up. But you had chicken rice today and you ate up all the rice. So she said, next time, what you should do is to eat half the rice and two times the chicken. And this was how I started. So now, I've worked all over the world. But what I've realized is that it doesn't matter. Every time I sort out people's eyesight and all of that, where they go, oh, I want to see better. When I spend enough time with them, they tell me it's actually very important that I look better also. Right? So when you look at this guy, we see all these pictures of people having lost a lot of weight. But what I want to draw attention to is he actually looks younger. He looks better. And it's just look at the face. Right? So these are the things that I think Maybe not this, because you girls, they are very slim. I'm rather slim. But it's actually this that is appealing to me, that my skin actually looks better, right? After exercise, I don't get pains much because I think the, 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 uh, the inflammation is very much decreased. This, and I work with dermatologists who would advise their patients to cut down their carbs and sugars because it drives acne. The aging eye issues that I see, are, well, this would happen to all of us. And this, the first one is trouble with vision for reading and distance. In Chinese, it's called la hua, yeah, presbyopia. And the second one is droopy eyelids. Now, this will hit all of us. But by eating foods that are high in carbohydrates and sugars, it increases the speed at which this happens. So what I mean, so some of you recognize Josh, Josh is a NUS uh, uh, MBA student, and I see them, and the problem they have is simply that they can't read anymore. So the reason why I'm bringing up these people is to say this is very real. It applies to all you slim people out there. It's not just the fat people. He was Mr. Poster Boy, and I'm allowed to bring this up because his problem is he's never worn glasses all his life. At 43, Suddenly, he can't read. It bothers him. Why does this happen? Because the lens in our eye, when we're, when we're younger, this lens in our eye looks like an auto zoom in a camera. It can focus on anything. Ooh, it can just far near anything. With age, it becomes dysfunctional. It doesn't work as well anymore. It actually hardens. In an 80-year-old, you know, we call it a cataract. Right? That sounds like something that happens to old people. But actually, this dysfunctional lens happens from the age of 40. The minute you have trouble reading, the lens has hardened. So what has actually contributed to this process, other than sunlight, smoking, is oxidative stress. And this comes from the carbohydrates and the sugars. 
which explains why diabetics develop cataracts so much quicker than non-diabetics, and they get it a lot younger. Yeah? So now, Hua is actually due to what we eat as well. The second one we get here is this droopy eye, or anywhere where the skin loses its elasticity. So if you look at a patient just here, this is him after surgery, but if you look at him before, and if you look at this lady, this is actually where it first happens. It's actually at the sides, and this is what we call hooding, right here. And so the first thing she notices is she can't put two colors of eyeshadow in, right? And this is actually due to, again, the things that we eat. Because the carbohydrates and the sugars, largely the sugars, causes, or it, it is called glycation. So what it does is it sweetens, if you like, the collagen. So what happens then is that it loses its elasticity. That's one. The other thing it does, it creates a type of collagen that's not great for how we look. So I'm bringing this up because, you know, if you remember the good old days when we tried to stop people from smoking, these are pictures of lung cancer and, and horrible, horrible pictures, right? And it didn't work to stop people from smoking. But now we show pictures of yellow teeth, yellow nails and wrinkles, suddenly it works mm -hmm. because it's, you know, how we look actually determines so much of how we behave, right? Our eating habits. Uh, on on, on the, the, the sort of much more of a health risk part, other than the looks, would be this group of patients. Now, these are the diabetics that I see in clinic. So I think uh, you guys in the media would have seen this on Sunday. It's a big thing. It's a bit shocking. Mm -hmm. The number of people in the world, and even in Singapore, who don't realize that they're diabetics. The percentage is horrifying. Now, the poor diabetics, what actually happens is that, you know, if you look at these blood vessels that we have, this is a normal eye, normal retina. So the retina is the back of the eye. You get a camera, it's the film of the camera. So at the back of the eye, we have the optic nerve, we have all these blood vessels. So the eye, we have the privilege of looking into the eye without doing any eye test, and we can tell what the rest of your blood vessels in your kidneys and your heart would look like. What happens in diabetes is that the sugars attack the basement membrane of the blood vessels. So if we imagine the blood vessel is like a hose attached to a pipe, it's actually the hose that has got little holes everywhere. So what happens then is whatever is flowing in the blood vessel starts to leak out. So this is cholesterol, this is your the blood in there, red blood cells as well, and water. So this is what a diabetic eye looks like. This is very much what his blood vessels would look like in very many other parts of his body. What we've realized, and what I do as an eye doctor, is I'm meant to treat this. So we laser the eye, we inject uh, all sorts of things into the eye, but it's almost like um, that we don't achieve very much because the cause of the problem still persists. Every time I treat a bit of it, it looks good, and it starts leaking again. And then I treat the next part, and then it leaks again. And each time I treat it, the patient loses some part of his vision. So what we've realized is that there's no point just treating the eye because it's a systemic problem. And I think that's a big thing because oftentimes I talk to the patients about um, how to lose weight. And the first thing they'll say to me is, you're an eye doctor. Why are you teaching me how to lose weight? Just concentrate on the eye. But it doesn't work like that. And what is frightening is that 60, so there are two types of diabetes. We have one type where people just take tablets, that's the commonest type, and the other one is the one that requires injection. Sometimes in the ones on tablets, the control is so poor, there would be an injection as well. But what it's shown is that 60% of patients who are diabetic actually have diabetic eye disease. And it's 100% of patients who are on insulin. And the patients who are on insulin tend to be quite young when they start developing diabetes, they could be 20 years old when they start. So this is actually quite frightening. And the one way we can control this is actually to control their diet. Um, and it has been shown, and we've done this on our patients as well, is that if they're on a good diet, they stop the carbohydrates and the sugars, they lose their fat, they can also lower their dose of medication, and with some patients, eliminate it altogether. So now that brings me to this part about um, the l carnitrin or l carnitrin which l carnitrin is what is found in the momentum box. Uh, it's been mentioned it's an amino acid. The interesting things about, about this in diabetics. Now, diabetics actually have a lower amount of l carnitrin in the body. Fatter people also have a lower amount of l carnitrin in the body. 
So by taking this, it improves their insulin sensitivity. The start of the diabetics, it reduces or it, it, it reduces the bad uh, cholesterol. And interestingly, with the carnitine, it reduces or it protects the cells from the stress, the oxidative stress. What that means is the pores that I'm talking about in the pores, that doesn't happen quite so much, so it leaks less. So this is very important. Um, so my experience with momentum of it, I've had about 100 uh, patients already since February last year. My spectrum of patients, they're not necessarily fat. So I have young patients, so that's people who are athletes. They do this to actually race faster, they swim faster. And it's not true at all that athletes need carbo loading. Okay? So all this is like, yeah, I have friends who run marathons and two days before carbo loading is an excuse, you know. Um, they're top athletes and really they're like either vegetarians or they're just on a high protein diet. What I find in a lot of patients is that they're fat, not for lack of triumph. One of it is actually just lack of awareness. Like, I have a patient who thinks that orange juice is, is fantastic, it's a really good thing. Or let's eat bananas, you know, grapes. So it's not from lack of trying. They try because they actually think that eating grapes is good because it's fruit. So these are the things that I think the program does because it makes, it educates people on what's good and what's not. And I think I was going to bring this up, but uh, I think that's been mentioned very well already. Because when I explain the program to patients, what I actually do is a bit of a hand movement thing. But what I find is that, you know, with all of us, we need a, a, a sugar level in order to function, whether it's to run or to work and to not be grouchy, right? We need a certain sugar level. Now, where we normally get it is we eat carbohydrates and sugars, and we keep doing this. Unfortunately, we never eat just enough. We always eat too much. So after a length of time, what actually happens is your sugar levels are maintained because you keep eating this, but you don't burn fat anymore, right? So your fat metabolism just starts to decrease, so you're like a big polar bear. So now what happens, if you want to lose weight, the only way to think about it sensibly is to increase your fat metabolism and to decrease this. It's really very, very difficult to do this yourself, to just cut down carbs and, and sugars all by yourself, because if nothing triggers your fat metabolism, you're going to be miserable, completely miserable, because your blood sugar levels are down. So I think that's where the strength of the program is, and that because it's 20, 20, 21 days of being very, very strict, I think, it kind of has a, there's a dead end. You know, there's a sort of a dead line at the end. You don't go, oh my God, this is forever. And I've had Indonesian patients, I, that they're not all very disciplined, most of them are not. And they usually say to me, I cannot do 21 days, can I do 7 days? <laughs> and I always say, yes, because after 7 days they realize, hey, it's actually not so difficult. One. Two, I've lost a hell of a lot of weight. That makes them keep on with the program. So this, so I never stop anyone from saying, so long as they're happy to start, I will encourage them. Yeah. Um, and this is something that I said, it's a very personal thing. Because uh, my husband would not tell you, so I get to tell you my, my bit of it. This was him um, before the start of the program. I tried, I tried to stop him from drinking orange juice. And if you, if, if there are women here who are married, um, mothers can't ever be, um, you know, you can never battle with a mother. So his plan was, he's, what he said was, my mother told me it's good for me. Uh, so there was orange juice in the morning. Um, coffee with sugar, and and I'm I'm just completely the opposite. I thought he would never listen to me ever ever ever. So when he started on this program, not for my encouragement, I still remember he held up a cup of coffee that morning and he said, "You know, I'm Swiss, and I'm about to have coffee without milk, and I'm not going to put sugar, and I might just die." <laughs> Disturbed, right? <laughs> okay, never mind, right? The wife keeps quiet. It was. And um, what was interesting was that um, I think it's a habit. It's like when someone asks you how, what you want in your coffee, and you just go, oh, I want sugar. It's like a habit. And then I, so this man is now forced to do something he normally would not do. And then he realizes, hey, it's not so difficult after all. And that's what I think is the strength of the program because he thinks. If the coffee is really so bad, it's only 21 days of bad coffee. I can deal with it. 
But what is interesting for me is because I'm a, I'm a big coffee drinker, he can actually discuss coffee with him now. Last time was, he used to say, it all tastes the same anyway. So long as you put milk and sugar, it doesn't matter whether the coffee is good or bad. <laughs> and he's right. So, um, so now I'm very pleased to say, it's very hard to change a man. He's got to do it on his own, and it worked. Um, he told me one day, he said, why well, did you realize codfish is so expensive? And I was like, yeah, because I've been the one who's been doing the shopping. So that's the good part about this program for the women when you put your husbands on it. Um, and it's worked for me very well. Uh, the baby looks like this. Um, so it's about 10 months old. Um, and I put on 8 kilograms during the time I was pregnant and I lost it in like maybe one month. So I think it's just triggering that fat metabolism. And then afterwards, it really doesn't matter how much fat you eat. And my anti-aging girl taught me two things in the beginning and I still remember it. She said, fat does not make you fat. Once your fat metabolism is triggered, eat all the cheese you want, eat all that long beef. Why have the avocado? That's not the problem. It's the carbohydrates and sugar that's going to kill you. And the other thing she says to me, which is very, very depressing when she said that, she said, when you eat something, it can only do two things to you. It's either good for you or it's bad for you. So you've got to remember, when you put that in your mouth, it's only one thing to do. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.